All right. And so that I'd like to um, tell everyone we're going to mute you all. And then I'm going to ask Jeff to unmute himself uh, so that uh, we can get started here. So hang on just a moment. All right. So then, Jeff, you can unmute yourself. No we'll get started. All right. Make sure we're recording here. Yes. So good morning, everyone, again. Uh, welcome to Tea and Topics. And um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this morning. He's going to be talking about how to take better pictures in nature parks, in, in nature in general. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jeff Klug. He is a photographer and has been one for over 38 years. He is the owner of Jeff R. Klug Photography, LLC. It's a photography studio and online gallery. He specializes in fine art photography with an emphasis on landscapes, architecture, and racing. He teaches photography as well as uh, photo editing programs like Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. That's one that a lot of people use. And uh, if you'd like to see some of his work, you can check out his website. It's www.jrkluge.com and you'll get a chance to see some of his wonderful work. So without further ado, uh, please um, welcome Jeff. So glad to have you this morning, Jeff. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, happy to do these kind of talks. And it's always fun to see other people that are somewhat interested in photography. And there's a lot of different ways these days to be able to t start taking pictures. So um, we'll get started right away here. Uh, let me just get my notes up. So uh, I've combined this talk into a bunch of different talks, and it's one that uh, a lot of people are interested in. Uh, photographing in nature parks and other areas and using the camera that you have with you. Yeah. Uh, a famous photographer out of New York, uh, Jay Maisel, always said, the best camera is the one that you have with you. And that's so true these days. We have um, our cell phone cameras, we have regular cameras, and the one that's with you is the one that you're going to be able to get a photo with. So the first thing you need to decide is what to photograph. Uh, are you going to photograph waterfalls, flowers, landscapes, people, birds? And then the next thought is how you're going to get there if you're going to drive by car, uh, go by plane. Uh, we'll all determine what equipment you're going to want to use. Uh, there's a lot of different equipment out there. Um, these days, the cell phone works really well. Uh, the new iPhones have just amazing cameras built into them. Uh, then you have uh, the DSLRs, which are the big cameras with interchangeable lenses. You have mirrorless cameras that are getting to be smaller with interchangeable lenses. And you have uh, point-and-shoot cameras. Now, all of these different types of cameras all have different uses depending on what you're going to photograph. For landscapes and a lot of regular stuff, any of these cameras will work just fine. Uh, even the cell phone. I've taken a lot of photos with my cell phone while also using my mirrorless camera uh, and getting about the same result. The only difference would be is that with the mirrorless camera, you're able to uh, make the images larger so you could print them bigger. Uh, with the cell phone cameras, with the new ones, you can go to about an 11 by 14 size print. With the mirrorless or the DSLRs, you're talking 16 by 20 all the way up to 24 by 36. Um, the point and shoots sort of fall in between, um, but they can be handy because they're small, they have an all-in-one zoom lens, and they can be a little less expensive um, in price. 
So with the cell phone, there isn't that much that you would need. And with the point and shoot, you pretty much have just the camera and maybe a tripod is all you're going to need. With the other two cameras, you you end up needing wide angle zoom lenses, telephoto zooms. If you're going to do flowers, you're going to want a macro lens. You may want a flash or some way to light up your subject. Um, these three cameras also need memory cards and batteries. So you can end up with a lot of stuff that you carry uh, going uh, to photograph. Uh, with the DSLR, the great part is you're looking right through the lens. And you can change the lens to get specific uh, images. So that can be very handy in the long run. You, can, you also have more control over the camera, and you have a larger sensor, which gets you a higher megapixels uh, for... A higher quality picture. You also can do raw files which uh, help in giving you more control over your exposure. Pretty much the same thing with a mirrorless camera except that the mirrorless new mirrorless cameras are lighter in weight. You're usually, usually looking through an electronic viewfinder so you're seeing exactly what the camera is taking a picture of. Um, you do have changeable lenses with a large variety of lenses available. Again, you have more control. You have a larger megapixel size and a larger sensor, and you also have a raw file format, which gets you more control. The point-and-shoot camera is a little bigger than a deck of cards uh, these days. It's, they've gotten them pretty small, but they have nice built-in zoom lenses. And they can run in price from $500 to $1,000. But the nice part is they're all in one. I love this little one um, that Nikon makes because when the lens is at, when the camera's turned off, that lens flattens out and you can just about put it in a pocket. Um, the disabilities with them is that the sensors are smaller, so you can't make as large of a uh, blow up of your image. And you have a li little more limited control of the settings on the camera. But it can be a great alternative to going to the big camera, and it's a little better than the cell phone cameras. Now, the cell phone cameras are great because generally we carry those with us all the time. They're small. They have just one or two lenses built right into them. Uh, you have some limited control over settings. Uh, the sensor is really small, but they make up for that in the processing power that's in the phone. Uh, some phones you can use, get a raw file format. Uh, but you need to use apps to be able to take uh, the photos, and there is a lot of different apps available. Uh, with the iPhone, uh, they probably have the best camera that I know of right now, and they have a number of different apps. The iPhone app that comes with the phone works pretty well. Uh, then there's a couple other apps uh, that I use. Uh, there's one called Halide app, Camera Plus, Pro Camera app, and then my favorite is the Lightroom mobile app. Now, the Lightroom mobile app is nice because it also works uh, with uh, Adobe's Lightroom uh, Classic and uh, regular Lightroom apps that can go on your computer as well as on your phone. And you can take uh, pictures using that app and it gives you a lot of control. And then after you've taken the picture, you do have the capability of um, processing it right away. So you can see exactly what you've gotten. Now, if I don't know if people are interested, but I can show you some of these apps, or I can just keep going on talking about the other stuff in it. So I'm sort of going to take a little poll here. Um, I'm not sure how we can do this, Mary, but... Um,
Does anybody, would everybody like to see the cell phone stuff? I'm not seeing too much. And I can't see the chat, Mary, so uh, yeah, I don't know. There's, yeah, there's nothing in the chat at the moment. Maybe we could cover a few of that of uh, those apps at the end. Sure, yeah, okay. we'll do that at the end. That sounds good. So there's also some Android apps for those people that do have Android phones. Um, I use iPhone, so I don't have as much uh, knowledge in the Android area. But there is the uh, Lightroom mobile app for Android. Uh, there's a better camera uh, app, uh, camera, FV5, camera max. And then one that's been pretty good is the DSLR camera pro. Just what those these apps do is just give you more control over taking the photo. Some equipment that you need uh, to take better photos is uh, a tripod. Um, that will get you a lot steadier and give you sharper pictures. Um, you use the tripod, the camera will just sit right on top. If you've got an iPhone uh, or cell phone, you've got these items that you can attach to a tripod, or this one actually just clamps onto anything and will hold the phone and it will give you a lot steadier, sharper picture. It helps you to keep the camera steady and level and the other tip is to keep your elbows in when you're taking uh, pictures with any of these cameras. It helps to get you um, a little more stable. Uh, the problem with some of these cameras is that you're holding them out in front of you and you tend to move your hands up and down a little bit more uh, depending on how steady you are. As I get older, I find I'm not quite as steady as I used to be. So um, you try every trick you can come up with. With the bigger cameras, there's different filters that you can use. Uh, there's a polarizing filter that will help get rid of the glare. And it makes the um, sky bluer, the greens and colors in the leaves and flowers uh, pop out a little bit more. Then there's also neutral density filters that help you in slowing, getting a slower shutter speed to be able to make uh, like waterfalls more silky and smooth. Then other stuff, depending on what you need, uh, is cable release when you've got the camera on a tripod, really helps to get you a, a sharper picture everything but the iPhone has that or the cell phones you can um, get some remote releases I haven't found many that are very reliable for the camera phones uh, but for the other cameras the cable release as well a photo bag to carry stuff in I actually wear a vest or actually it's sort of a vest type belt that has the equipment around my waist, uh, especially if I'm hiking in long distances, so I can carry all the different lenses that I think I'm gonna need when I'm uh, at the spot to photograph. Um, depending on how I travel, I have a number of different types of camera bags that I use. And if I'm traveling by car, I tend to bring everything. Uh, friends of mine laugh at me because I bring so much stuff that I fill up a Chevy Tahoe just with my equipment. And uh, my friends barely have room for their suitcases and camera equipment. But uh, when I go somewhere, I make sure I have everything with me. Other stuff that I bring with, um, especially if I'm hiking any kind of distance, uh, is water. Uh, some food or snacks to keep my energy level up. Um, I always bring my cell phone uh, either to take extra pictures or to call for help if there is such. Um, I do bring a GPS uh, unit so I don't get lost. But I also keep a paper map with me uh, for the trails. Uh, flashlight, first aid kit. And generally, believe it or not, I bring toilet paper in my vehicle all the time because I've run into some parks where it gets really hard. And when you're in need, toilet paper is really handy. So, um, so 
before you go on the trip, you should research where you're going to go and what you're going to photograph. Um, a lot of good spots are the National Parks uh, website, the MPS.gov. Um, they always have good information on all the state and, and federal parks. Um, the USGA uh, map service is nice for finding trails and roads. Um, one that I don't have in here is the Del, Del Morea um, map book for each state. I carry one of those in my car. Um, it shows all those little side roads to find, get you into different areas. I use Google Earth for research. And I look at travel books. I have a shelf full of travel books for the different areas I like to go to uh, so I can keep researching. This is what a USGA map looks like. It's just a very high detailed map. Uh, plus, you can get some that are even more detailed with hiking trails on. Um, I also use iPhone and iPad apps. Um, Stuck on Earth it gives me some good information. Sunseeker gives me where the moon and the sun are going to be. And it's really a nice uh, app for uh, knowing where your shadows will be. Google Earth lets you, um, you know, look at spots all around the world. Photographer's Ephemeris is another one that shows me where the sun and the moon are and also where the Milky Way is. And I do a lot of Milky Way shooting at night. Um, so that's why I also put in here planets so that you can know where the moon is and the different planets might be. I also have a weather radio app so that I don't get caught with a storm while I'm out in the different uh, parks. Once I get there, I talk to the park rangers, find out what going on in the park what uh, things are good to photograph there um, I'm generally photographing waterfalls wildflowers and birds if they're around or animals depending on you know which park I happen to be going to um, the most important things for shooting is to hold your camera steady um, that's what messes up most photographers is not keeping that camera steady. A tripod is really helps you in that. Uh, otherwise, bracing yourself up uh, on the car, uh, depending on you know how you're shooting and where you're shooting. Uh, watch for light, uh, large, bright, or dark areas that will mess up your camera exposure. Um, you won't see that till after you take a photo, so sometimes you have to take a shot, see if there's something too bright. Usually, if you have a real bright and a real dark area, uh, that can cause problems. Shooting in RAW, which is the, a RAW file, um, gives you stuff that you can um, process. You need to process, and generally you can pull more information out of a RAW file over say a jpeg file which is the standard one that most cameras take so the best time to take photos uh, generally and i'm a, have a hard time with this one but it's before sunrise usually an hour before till about 10 a.m and then after noon from 4 p.m. till after sunset. And actually, you can go to an hour or so after sunset um, to get your best shots. Now, I also shoot even later into the night, which makes the morning sunrise uh, a little harder because I like to shoot Milky Way. And that you have to generally wait for a couple hours after sunset before you can start shooting that. So before sunrise till 10 a.m., that's when you have probably the nicest color. Um, the sky is warmer. Everything's warmer as, as the sun comes up. And you can see this is right before the sun uh, hit the horizon. And you get that nice uh, glow. And uh, if you get some clouds, it actually gets you a little more color in the sky. Also, early in the morning, you can get fog on the lakes and here I got lucky we had a full moon that was um, setting 
just as as the sun was coming up and it worked out real nice a nice fall colored day we had fog on the lake and um, the full moon showing up once you get later in the day you can see the fog just burns itself off and then you you get a little brighter light now this is right near the end of when i would be shooting uh, because as it gets later everything gets a little more contrastier and the dark areas will go a little darker the bright areas will be a little brighter and you won't have much detail in between but early morning you can get the fog and that really helps give you a nice soft uh, photo uh, you have to watch the dew point and if you get lucky um, you get the right dew point you're able to get the fog and you'll you'll get some nice shots with that in the afternoon uh, it's usually about 4 p.m. in the afternoon till after sunset and I shoot two hours before sunset till an hour after sunset if I'm just photographing the sunset and you watch for that golden hour which happens right after the sunset uh, generally it takes about a, actually a half hour 45 minutes for it to happen and that basically is the sun lighting up the clouds uh, and can be really pretty colors uh, but if you don't have clouds then you generally don't get that but you can look at different uh, things as the sun is uh, going down you can start looking at wave action and the clouds and you can see you get uh, after the sun's down that sky turned a nice orange color also everything that you're shooting from about 4 p.m. on is going to be warmer in, in its look um, the sun as it gets starts to set in the afternoon everything starts to warm up again just like it did in the morning and here this is a smoky mountains where you get a lot of fog even at night and uh be, and that's because that's why they call them the smoky mountains and you can see this is just uh the sun's uh, up in the sky yet but coming down and you're starting to get some nice clouds um and you never know when you're shooting a sunset here i was photographing getting ready actually to do milky way stuff and i turned around as the sun was setting i saw a fisherman sitting in lake michigan as the sun went down and clouds help make a sunset and so we always hope that we get clouds uh when the sun goes down and you could see this is the that afterglow and uh, the clouds are starting to light up and you get this gorgeous colors but you need the clouds there for the sun to hit uh, to get the colors other good times to shoot uh, a lot of people end up doing something else i go out when it's raining and very cloudy rain gives you more saturated colors you do have to protect your equipment while you're out there but um, you can get a lot of interesting pictures on a rainy day um, i find especially in the busy parks like the smoky mountains that when it's a rainy day all the people stay inside or they go shopping i'm out in the park and all of a sudden i have the whole park to myself so it's really nice the light is less contrasty it's just perfect for shooting close-ups of plants uh, may not work great for large vistas but it's great for waterfalls even during the middle of the day it's it's just like giving you a soft um, overcast just really helps you sh shoot a lot longer into the day plus you can get some interesting clouds uh, this is in the smoky mountains and it was raining most of the day and it would break and i'd get these gorgeous clouds that would um, make the image look a lot more interesting also when you're shooting flowers you you get the rain hitting the flowers making the flowers look a little more interesting the leaves are a little shinier and you get the nice drops on the flower to make it now this was actually taken with one of my with my cell phone um, 
it was easier to use that than some of my other equipment and you can just bend over and you know compose the shot real nice but with rain this road this is um in Cades cove in the smoky mountains generally this road is bumper to bumper with cars when you get a rainy cloudy day people stay away and i was able to get these shots um without any cars or people in the photo and actually the clouds help make the photo this is in Cades Cove as well in the Smokies and you got these horses that are out grazing and it was actually the sun sort of peeks through it at times and but the nice overcast gives an interesting look to the photo and the horses sort of make a nice shot. Other times that um, I've shot when I shoot um, lighthouses we're generally up early in the morning this was a sunrise shot and uh, we weren't going to go because it it was actually raining at our hotel and i have a philosophy that well once i'm up before sunrise and dressed i might i'm going to go out and i dragged my friend with we went out and shot this and it actually turned out to be one of our better sunrise shots um we didn't get the sun but we had breaks in the clouds which gave for uh, nice beams of light and because it was a stormy morning we had a little bit of wind we got great wave action and it just makes what a lighthouse is there for is to help people and this just set the scene a lot better now the bad times to shoot is midday from about 10 a.m to 4 p.m so uh, when you're shooting during the middle of the day generally your light as in this picture here is real contrasty and you can't get a lot of detail out of things it's very harsh you get deep shadows it can work for close-ups if you're working in the shade and under cover you can also do what they call a high dynamic range photo which actually takes a couple of photos and merges it together the cell phones will do that and so will the the bigger cameras um it can be a whole nother talk because it 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 takes an extra program uh if you're not using your cell phone for you to process these high dynamic range but it it just gives you a, a broader range of light recording to be able to um, see more detail for example, on the left side is a, a photo just taken straight, and you can see, you can't see inside that much. It's a pretty harsh, bright light, uh, but the one on the right has, is a high dynamic range photo, and all of a sudden you've got detail that you can see inside, underneath in the shadows, and it can work well. You need to do this on a tripod because it is taking multiple photos and you it needs to merge those three photos together so generally during midday um, it's a great time to take a break review your morning shots get ready to or travel to your next location or scout out possible locations also if you're going with a family uh, it's a great time to spend more time with the family so that you get your photo time in the early morning and late afternoon. Uh, just a couple of, not, I, I don't believe in rules that much. The rules of third does help you uh, compose a picture a little bit more, but there are a lot of times that it works for breaking it. Uh, here in, in this photo, generally the the moon is um in one third uh i do have the horizon split in the center generally i would have the horizon more on a lower third or an upper third but with the moon and the really nice reflection it would work better to keep the horizon in the middle um yep see yeah that is the right one uh with this one the horizon's more at the lower third point the rainbow is in the upper third 
and then the wave is in the third going this way. So it's just a way to be able to help give you a little more uh, idea of where you're going to um, have your, your important points of the photo. If it's in any of those third intersections, generally that's an important point and will get your attention. The same here, this wave is in the one-third point, or approximately. I mean, this doesn't have to be exact, but it, it's in the one-third area. So your eye tends to go to it a little bit more. Leading lines work pretty nice. It leads you into the photo and then around to be able to look at things. Roads are great for leading lines. It leads you right into this photo, into the nice fall color. Um, this is up in the Smoky Mountains. And rivers work well for leading you into the photo as a leading line. So let's talk about a few things that you can photograph. Uh, if you're photographing waterfalls or cascades, uh, the best thing to do is use a really slow shutter speed, generally a, a couple of seconds. I actually like a couple seconds to up to 15 to 20 seconds. I also look to get reflections in the pool, which when you use a slower shutter speed will let you get um, nice reflections. You want to try various angles and try for close-ups of different parts. This was, you know, just one small part in a waterfall. So using a zoom lens, I could zoom in and get this one little maple leaf that got caught on this old piece of wood in the middle of a waterfall. Again, here's you can see how the nice slow shutter speed gives you a nice silky look to the waterfall. Uh, the waterfall itself gives you a nice leading line to bring you in. And this is a, a waterfall off of one of my favorite roads down in the Smoky Mountains, um, Roaring Fork Road. And you can take this, you're right on the um, edge of the road. This is Laurel Falls in the Smoky Mountains. Uh, a nice easy walk to get to this one. It takes about 20 minutes on a, actually an asphalt path. Uh, but it's a nice little waterfall, um, and you can see this is a, about 10 seconds ex exposure, which you'll usually need a neutral density filter if it's a pretty bright day. And a neutral density filter is basically like a pair of sunglasses. It just cuts down on the amount of light and um, lets you get a slower shutter speed. Here's another waterfall in the Smokies. You can tell I've gone to the Smokies for 25 years, and it's a great place to go to. Um, I can drive it, basically get there in one day, one long day of driving. But it's got great stuff to photograph in spring, summer, and fall. Although summer and fall, it gets very crowded. Here's, um, this is Grotto Falls in the Smokies. Um, if you didn't do a long exposure on this one, you just would see a few little streams of water dripping down. But with a longer exposure, it makes it look a little silkier, smoother, and um, makes it stand out a lot more. This one's a hard waterfall to get to. It's uh, a mile and a half uphill all the way oh. getting there. So... I don't go there as often as I'd like to because it takes quite a bit. It's, it's a half day, uh, especially when you're lugging. For me, when I carry camera equipment, I got about 20 to 30 pounds of camera gear I lug with me. So makes for a long hike. This is Bond Falls uh, in northern Wisconsin. Um, it, it's a neat falls in that it's got a Z shape which it's actually a concrete structure. It's uh, part of a dam set up uh, for generating electricity. But this is a really nice spot in fall. Um, you get these nice reflections with the long exposure, and you also need a bright uh, blue sky 
day and then you can get the colors uh, from these trees across the way lighting up in the water so it, it can be a really pretty falls to photograph um, pond areas in in the creeks uh, are also make for a nice picture because it can reflect everything that uh, is in the fall color um, again this is the smoky mountains and when you get the nice yellow leaves uh, you do need to do this either early morning or later afternoon to get the warmth but um, it works out pretty well here's another pond um, with the yellow color reflection sometimes you do have to work to find that right angle to get the color in the water you you have to shift up or down um, until you find the right angle to get it but it's worth um, a lot of times it's you're shooting a little bit lower and then you need the longer shutter speed tends to get you more detail in those ponds Photographing flowers. Timing is always the biggest trick with flowers. Um, finding a or finding a good flower. Uh, you've got um, the orchids, which work out pretty well, and you want to try to get a depth of field so that the background is out of focus um, with these. And depth of field is your area in focus as you close your lens down you get a larger depth of field so you need to find uh, a spot in between so that your background can be out of focus and your flower is nice and sharp um, most of these i generally will use a tripod um, or use flash uh, to help freeze it but um, so you you, you got to watch you know what you want to get and how you want to get it now this one was just sort of handheld because i'm trying to shoot almost straight down onto this lily pad and i couldn't find a place for a tripod but it was bright enough you can see how bright because of the bright shadow but you can get some pretty good detail from it this one is with a point-and-shoot camera that I had uh, with me when I was hiking one of the trails um, uh, down in, I think, the Smokies. And uh, although I have a lot of these flowers growing um, on my property as well, so I get a lot of different chances to get these. And shooting straight down works pretty nice, again, with a sort of a shallower depth of field, so you want to keep the flower sharp but you want to get the background out of focus this is a tulip tree um, it gets you an interesting looking flower uh, I've this is down in the Smokies again so it, it gives you a lot being that this is in the shade it gives you a little softer light hitting the flower plus I also shoot it early morning now this tree unfortunately the park department cut down one year um, to make room for more buildings but they have a new one planted and i'm hoping to start getting more of these i used to photograph this group of trees all the time and sort of frustrating when they cut down the tree but yeah uh Trillium are all over the place. Uh, they're very prevalent in the Smoky Mountains. They grow in big patches down there. But I even have them here. I find them on um, the Ice Age Trail here in Wisconsin quite often. Um, so they, they're an early spring flower. It's fun to shoot them almost straight down. Uh, and they can be I know I found a lot of different colored trillium as well in the Smokies not so much here um, this was just out in a field um, we were photographing flowers in the field and found this uh, nice one with uh, the Japanese beetle which actually isn't a very nice bug but it it, it looks interesting but um, I've had it had these guys destroy a couple of um, Harry Lauder walking stick um, 
plants that I had on my property. They mm -hmm. just ate all the leaves away. So uh -huh. I used to like them, don't like them anymore because they're really doing a lot of damage these days. Um, and hopefully they're going to disappear from this area soon again. Um, here's an orchid that I found. Uh, I don't remember where, but I, I did sort of a soft focus type thing. It was early morning. You can see the water on the plants. Um, so you can try a lot of different techniques when you process the image to, to get an interesting looking flower. Um, here's another one that I just uh, found out in the field uh, when I'm photographing and you get lucky, you look for the right lighting hitting the plant. And again, you want to get a shallow depth of field so that the background is out of focus, but the flower stays nice and sharp. Um, my, one of my favorite things is lighthouses. Uh, I've traveled around Lake Michigan and, uh, Lake Superior photographing the different lighthouses. Also have gotten a few down in, um, Florida as well. But um, they're best shot early in the morning or again near sunset. Uh, I like them when we, you get either nasty weather or fog. And some of them that are close to the um, water, are, I watch for good wave action. And then I also have a choice of doing a long shutter speed to soften the water out or a short, a fast shutter speed to get the wave action. Um, I love to shoot the interiors as well as the exteriors. The stairways are always interesting. And they seem to be different. This is one of my favorite lighthouses. This is up in Whitefish Point in the Upper Peninsula. Um, it's got a bright red roof with a white building and with the right time of day and um, sky, it just is a gorgeous lighthouse to photograph. The hard part is it's a very popular lighthouse and it's really hard to find time when there's nobody around. This lighthouse is in Manistique, uh, Michigan, uh, in the UP. And uh, the nice part about this one is that it, it has a nice Z-shaped um, thing to be able to get out to the lighthouse. And with the shoreline, you get a nice little uh, Z pattern to get there. Um, I find all sorts of different angles once I'm at a lighthouse. Here's another spot from the beach and I'm laying on my stomach shooting straight out and I just happen to get probably one of the nicest cloudy days um, that you can get for this shot. Uh, split, split Rock Lighthouse up in um, Minnesota is another fun one to shoot. Uh, it's right on the edge of a cliff, so you can get some really nice wave action. Uh, this is near sunset, so it warms the lighthouse up. Uh, you don't see the sun setting because it's off to the left, uh, setting behind some mountains and that. But when you can get there at the right time, this is early morning, um, you get the nice wave action and the lighthouse, and then if you get good clouds, it even works better. Um, this is Grand Marais uh, in Minnesota, and just photographing on a rainy day where we got some nice wave action and the lighthouses uh, in the background. This is Whitefish Point again. You can see it's not quite as nice of a shot because we didn't have as many nice clouds that day. But that red roof and the white lighthouse just really gives a nice contrast with the blue sky. Stairways are neat. I'm either shooting down or shooting up a stairway. Uh, the curved uh, steps going up a lighthouse. Um, good exercise. A little tough to do sometimes because uh, for me I'm tall and I tend to almost hit my head on the stairs above me. But... I handhold to get these shots, but it gets hard because it's not always very bright in those stairways. And you always get a lot of people up going up and down. Here's more wave action at Split Rock. 
Uh, birds are another interest of mine. Um, it's fun. Uh, best to get them when they're doing something. Although with birds, you need really long, strong telephoto lenses and tripods. Uh, I keep going back to the same areas, um, and it takes a lot of patience to get good shots of birds. Uh, you do need to learn the bird's behavior. It will, they will usually come back to the same area. Um, this osprey had just caught a fish, and he brought it to that same branch, and then he'd disappear and bring another one back and eat it. Yeah. So we were able to get a number of good shots of the osprey. Um, here's an egret um, in a pond with a bunch of alligators. Um, this is a, was a great area in Florida to photograph uh, the birds. And actually, it's in a, a park called um, uh, Gatorland because they, the birds are all living right in um, among all the alligators. Um, this was, I'm not sure where these were shot. Some of these birds are, most of them I think are down in Florida, uh, right uh, either on the ocean or uh, on a small river. But it's fun to get them while they're, you know, eating something. Generally, they're always looking for food. And here it was just um, a little tidal pool area that the birds were in. I'm always looking for action. If I can get them while they're flying, uh, it's always uh, more interesting of a shot. But it's also more difficult to get uh, because they're moving. It takes a lot of practice and patience. Huh. Um, you get ducks with the little, uh, their babies floating around. Uh, love to photograph the loons. I uh, go up to Sini and the UP, uh, Sini National Wildlife Park. They've got a bunch of different ponds that you drive around and can photograph the loon. Uh, if you go at the um, middle of June, middle to the end of June, they usually have their young, and you can get them um, feeding their young. So, um, and these ponds are all, has a road that you just drive along, you just pull over on the side when you see some of the birds, and um, you tr hope that they're close enough to be able to get shots like this. But this is a very long telephoto lens. I think this was a seven, uh, 600 millimeter oh. lens, um, and I probably cropped it in quite a bit to be able to get this because they're they're always that's the frustrating part with birds is they're always far out in the lake. You get the swans um, also in June uh, can be very interesting and at least they're a bigger bird easier to photograph. And if you can catch them while they're flying. This one was dipping its wing, trying to scare another bird out of the area. Other things to photograph, be prepared for anything. Um, when we're in Florida, we run into alligators quite often. So you, you watch and you check to see where items are. You try to get off the beaten trail and you keep your eyes open for new, new ideas. This is a vine that I shoot in the Smoky Mountains every year, and it just is an interesting vine. It keeps getting bigger and bigger uh, every year we go, and it's sort of like my first shot when I get to the Smokies is this vine. <laughs> but when we're in Florida, we were at Disney World, and we were walking the park, and not a lot of people think of looking up. And if you look up, this is a ceiling in the Chinese area, and they have a very interesting look. I ended up laying on my back in the middle of this building with people walking around me, friend keeping people away so I could just quickly get this shot um, of the ceiling uh, of the inside of the building. While I was hiking in the Smokies, uh, a couple said, oh, did you see that old car? up the way and I said no and they said you go up a little ways you'll see a little path um, it's hard to see but you follow that a couple hundred yards 
and I found this old beat up truck in an area that you'd <laughs> never would think you'd find a truck and um, spent a good hour photographing it. Uh, just wandering around, I found this horseshoe hinge that was on a um, doorway or, or something and just found that really interesting how they took an old set of horseshoes and turned it into a hinge. Um, this is a collection of car and motorcycle parts from a place called uh, Dragon's Tail. And it's a road in uh, the Smoky Mountain area that's very curvy. I can't remember. It's something like a hundred different curves. And people take it with their cars and their motorcycles uh, going as fast as they can. And these are the parts from the bikes that have crashed they hung it all up into one tree and so it was something really different um it's a fun road to drive but it's also a very dangerous road <laughs> it looks like it um down in the smokies we run into different animals um just walking through and uh, we were walking along the trail and here this guy popped up right in front of us and uh, there was a, a young one next to it that um, I got later on. Also, sometimes I just saw a couple deer. This is in Cades Cove in the Smoky Mountains. This tree I love to photograph, and all of a sudden I saw these two heads pop up. And the two deer were just sitting there, uh, middle of the afternoon, enjoying the nice sun. Um... When I'm looking for lighthouses, I'm into a lot of port areas. I've been to this spot a number of times. This is two harbors in Minnesota and never caught a, an, uh, a ship loading or unloading. This one day I did, and then I got lucky with a seagull flying by. But um, So you never know where you go. I, I go back to the same places over and over again because one year you'll catch something at the right time next year you'll find some other time oh. just walking around i found this old um uh caboose that um had a great texture in the paint my mother always loved cabooses so anytime i found one i would spend time photographing it for her <laughs> um a few last tips um i returned to the same place multiple times uh, every time you go back to some place, and, and that can be even local, you know, the River Edge Nature Center is going to change from day to day, weather to weather. Um, any of the parks that I visit here, even in Wisconsin, they're always different each day that I go. Weather can change the area. Don't stay in when it's a rainy day or foggy day. Go out and figure out a place to go. Um, fog makes for such a lovely photograph. Um, when you get familiar with an area, you start to come up with new ideas. And then don't be afraid to try different lenses and different angles to shoot. Um, if you're at a place, you may not get back there right away. So spend the time to you know, try a lot of different shots. Um, this is out in Las Vegas area, Red Rock Canyon. And I've gone there a lot of times in one year, all of a sudden I noticed the face in the, this mountainside. And now I go back and I photograph it every time. And um, it's always been a, a fun little place to shoot. Out in, uh, this is the Valley of Fire. I was at a workshop, um, taking a workshop for with another photographer. And we're all photographing models. And all of a sudden I go and look, uh, I look up and I see the sun is starting to set. And it had gotten real cloudy and got some nice beams showing through in this nice rocky area. Um, this is in Wisconsin near Baraboo, uh, just driving around, found this little uh, pasture area with a couple of horses, and it was an early fall day, so we had some leaves on the trees and some were changing, um, but you just never know what you'll find being out 
And we're when we're in Florida, we're looking for birds. We're looking all over the place. And you just never know what you're going to find. Smoky Mountains again at a sunset, uh, after sunset with that great afterglow. Um, you never know when you're going to get it, so you just have to be prepared. And here's another sunset. So just a couple of things to leave you with. Uh, most images need to be processed. Um, I use Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. It's generally $10 a month. It's uh, called uh, Lightroom Classic and Photoshop. You get that as a pair for the $10 a month, and it's probably the best system because uh, Lightroom catalogs the images, lets you do a lot of processing, lets you print, and um, it lets you uh, do a, uh, make books and different things. Photoshop is what I use to be able to fix a picture up that needs major work, and it's a little harder to learn but it works real well. Uh, for somebody that doesn't want to learn how to do a lot, there's a new program called Luminar AI. It runs about $90, and it can be a standalone um, processing for raw files and regular files. The nice part with this, it has artificial intelligence, and it does a really good job for people who just want to hit a couple of buttons and get some good photos. Um, another one out there is On One Photo Raw. Actually, the new one now is 2021. Runs about $100. It also uses some artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a little harder. It sort of falls in between Luminar AI and Photoshop for difficulty. Uh, there are a lot more out there, but um, these are the ones that I tend to work with. Um, so I, I got to end with my favorite photographer, Ansel Adams. You don't make a photograph just with a camera. You bring to the act of photography all the pictures you have seen, the books you have read, the music you have heard, and the people you have loved. Um, Ansel was, to me, one of the best photographers out there. Um, he spent a lot of time in the dark room, along with uh, spending a lot of time uh, photographing. And here's my contact information, uh, my website, if you have questions about things. I also teach photography. Um, I teach basic photography, uh, Photoshop and Lightroom. Uh, work with a lot of different people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, basically through Zoom. And we do that. I also sell some fine artwork, which is also on my website. Uh, and there's a number of different groups that I, I also work with. Um, if a person's interested in learning, uh, joining camera clubs, um, Google Wisconsin Area Camera Club Organization. We're a group of 24 camera clubs in the state of Wisconsin. So they've, most of them are in this corner of the state, but we actually cover the whole state. Um, we also offer uh, seminars, and um, we have a digital forum that happens on the fourth Saturday of the month from 10 till noon, where you can ask questions with your photo problems, and we try to answer them. We have a great panel of people for that. So looks like I did it right in a little over an hour. I can't great believe job. that. <laughs> <That's> wonderful. <laughs> so, but, um, um, let me yeah, I think people have had a chance to write everything down, but then we'll get into some of the questions that are in the chat. We sure. had some of them for, for quite some time. So um, let's see. Um, which cameras that cost approximately $500 would you recommend for photography? Um, for something like that. Yeah. Uh, probably going to be a point and shoot camera. The, the middle price cameras that say Nikon and Canon make um, with, that are point and shoot and that have uh, one built in lens would probably be something that would work. 
it's not going to do great for birds or you know stuff real far away um although nikon does have a point and shoot that has a very strong telephoto lens but i believe that runs in the eight or nine hundred dollar price range all right, we have a couple questions about cell phone apps. Could you suggest a couple? Uh, one asked specifically about Android apps, but otherwise just general cell phone apps. Yeah, um, let me see if I can go back. Uh, I've got a couple uh, Android ones that uh, I mentioned here. I just got to get back to it here. I don't do Android quite as often as I do iPhone. Uh, come on. Probably would have been quicker to jump in out. Oh. Okay, Android ones. Well, Lightroom mobile app um, w works, I believe, on uh, Android phones. And so if you get the Lightroom Classic, um, it would uh, give you an iPhone app that works, or uh, an app, camera app that would work pretty well. Um, DSLR Camera Pro would be another app that would work uh, on Android. Um, and a better camera is another app on Android that works, that gives you more control of um, shooting. Good to hear. All right. And did you have any others um, for just people that don't have Android, but um, like, say, for instance, the iPhone? Yeah, for the iPhone, um, the Lightroom mobile app, again, is probably one of my favorites. Uh, the Halide, H-A-L-I-D-E, uh, is a really nice uh, phone app. Uh, it, it gives you good control of the phone. And what I like is it has a... Um, thing in the center that helps you keep level which is always the biggest problem taking iphone pictures is you know you hate having that horizon go on an angle so true so um those would so, be the ones i'd recommend okay um rachel would like to know if you could tell her the difference between an lrcc and a classic okay yeah the the one light the regular they call it now lightroom cc is um one where you store your images in adobe's cloud and they give you one terabyte of file storage the lightroom classic is actually stored on your computer and you store the images on your computer and work with them that way um I recommend the Classic over the Lightroom CC just because uh, it, it you've got the photos right on your computer. For me, Lightroom uh, CC doesn't work because I have more than one terabyte worth of photos. Most wow. people probably don't. Um, but it's Lightroom CC was meant for people that are basically shooting with cell phones and nothing else. Okay. So um, I like Lightroom Classic works a little better. And you've got the photos right on your computer. You can upload photos uh, to the cloud. They give you less cloud storage, but that's how you can share it with friends and family. All right. So we're also curious about... Um, so the loons, what, where did you find the loons that you took photographs of? The loons that I photograph are up in Sini National Wildlife uh, Preserve, uh, up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, it's sort of in, about in the middle. I, I stay at uh, Munising, and it's about a half hour... Uh, drive uh east of munising on the main road and you'll find nasini they have about eight different pools and you can drive all around these different pools and that's when you can photograph all the loons and they have a bunch of loons there wow how fun yeah loons fact, and swans are, oh great great images yeah. Um, so for people who are looking for loons a little closer to home, I know once in a while they are found at Pluckett's Pond in Harrington Beach State Park in the spring. 
Um, and then of course, many of our um, Northern lakes during the summer months. So, so they're, they're here too. You just have to look a little harder perhaps. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The, that's a nice part with Sini is there's a lot of them. Um, they have probably 10 or 15, like uh, uh, usually a pair on each pond and then a couple of um, males floating around uh besides so it's a better shot at getting them i i know east bass lake has one in northern wisconsin because i have a friend that's got a cabin up there uh -huh. yeah. and uh he photographs one up there all the time but yeah they're hard hard when it's just one <laughs> for, sure. for sure so um craig just added um he said um monthly adobe costs nine dollars and 99 cents and it includes online training for so for those of you that are looking for, uh, you know, uh, a way of learning about this, um, and also at the same time, you, um, you know, you have Adobe, um, you know, to use too. So, right, yeah, Adobe has a lot of training. Um, there is a guy, uh, Terry White. He's a Adobe evangelist. Um, <laughs> he he does a every Friday. He does a. Um, one hour talk on Lightroom and Photoshop, and it's free. You can find them on YouTube if you um, just put in Terry White, W-H-I-T-E. He's a great um, one for teaching Lightroom, and it's wow. free. Oh, <laughs> so yep. um, looks like Jan wanted to know what picture or person did you see in your Red Rock Canyon uh, in Vegas photo? <laughs> oh, the, there's... Um, <clears throat> Let's see if I can. Oh. Uh, let's see if we escape and get. I can try to. I'll point it out again. Uh, there, it's an old man. <laughs> let's see. Here he is. Ah, there's the face. <laughs> Here's the face right here. Yes. Oh, fun. You got the nose, the mouth, the eyes. A lot of times I find an artist sitting down uh, right right around in here um, sketching this this mountainside. Amazing. Oh. So uh, it's it was a fun find when I found it. I bet. <laughs> Quite an image. Um, yeah. and, and Sharon would like to know how you spell the scene na uh, National Wildlife Area, where you saw the loons. Um, how is that spelled? <laughs> S-E-N-E-Y. Ah, who would guess that there was a Y at the end? <laughs> yep. Wow. Well, um, I don't know if anybody else has any more questions, if you'd like to ask them in person. Otherwise, I, um, I think we've run out of questions in the chat. So. Um, anybody okay. else have a quick question you'd like to ask Jeff? Um, a big thank you um, from, from the audience here. Sure. And like I said, if you guys have questions, um, email me, give me a call. I'm always happy to answer. Um, I, I love helping people out. So um, well. if, if you guys get this recording, you can just find that at the end and, um, you know, contact me happy to do anything i can for you well i want to tell everybody that um jeff stepped forward to do this program for us this morning um he's part of the um photo club that um regularly meets on the, the last tuesday of the month uh and it has been meeting virtually um so anybody that wants to can actually um join in that group if you'd like um the link for the photo club meetings is on the River Edge website. So you just click on the last Tuesday of the month and click on, on the photo club event. And that's where you'd find the Zoom link and you can join the photo club uh, and find out what they're talking about uh, on Tuesdays. Um, otherwise, again, I'd like to thank Jeff for, for doing this for us. I, I learned a lot. Uh, that rule of thirds is going to be um, something I'm gonna really work <laughs> on uh, because my pictures tend to be pretty skewed. Uh, and the good advice about 
about, you know, bracing yourself, keeping your elbows in closer. That, um, that'll allow all of us to take better uh, pictures that aren't quite so distorted. But uh, thank you again, Jeff. I want to remind everybody else that um, you can find this recording on the Riverhead website uh, about a week from now when we get it from Zoom. Uh, it will be archived there under adult programs uh, and then uh, under TN Topics. So, uh, so look forward in about a week if you'd like to see it uh, again and, and again get, get Jeff's information. Um, for those of you that have been following in this program, the next one will be on the 23rd of March. And uh, in that program, uh, Jay Feeker from, from um, MMSD will be talking about rain gardens, how to construct one, construct one and, uh, and basically what kinds of plants to put in there. And he will have some help from the master gardeners uh, who he works with regularly. So join us again on the 23rd. Otherwise, uh, say goodbye to all of you and thank you for joining us here today. And thanks again, Jeff. Bye all. No Bye. problem. Glad to do it. Thank you. Glad to have you. Thanks so much. Thank you.